Hello, this is Tom Repass of Canyon Rim Honeybees in the beautiful Black Hills of Western South Dakota. This presentation is an introductory uh, presentation uh, all about queens, queen bee basics. This presentation I have given as a standalone presentation uh, to new beekeepers uh, to learn about queens, not only queen bee breeding, but more so about how honeybees reproduce and then some of the basics surrounding queen bees. If you're an intermediate to advanced beekeeper and you really want to delve into the uh, techniques and theory behind queen bee production, then you can probably skip uh, past this presentation. On the other hand, if you're a relatively new beekeeper, it is good to understand honeybee breeding and reproduction so that you can have a better idea of some of the techniques that we will do la use later when we're actually l learning how to raise queen bees. There's some basic information on how to find your queens, how to requeen, marking and clipping of queens, how to introduce queens. Now, studying, reading, watching YouTube videos is very useful to give you a foundation of knowledge. The truth is, though, the real learning with all things beekeeping does not occur by watching YouTube channels, but when you're out there in the bee yard, you're out there with a hive open looking at the bees, looking at your combs, really learning and seeing and learning from experience. That said, it is good to have a basic understanding of why our bees do what they do so that you can have a better understanding of what you might be observing uh, when out in the field. Well, let's talk about queen bee development and physiology. A little review of the birds and the bees. Or in our case, our case we'll be talking just about the bees. This is really important to know. We call it uh, honey bee math or queen bee math. Uh, these dates are really helpful, even if you're never going to raise queen bees yourself, to know how long does it take for an egg to hatch. If you see eggs present, you know there has been a queen bee in that hive at least sometime within the last three days. Uh, when you see a queen cell, knowing how long it'll take for it to be capped, how long it'll be capped, and when that uh, queen bee will emerge will help you uh, understanding the timing of when to remove queen cells from the cell builder or when you're going to expect to see the first eggs from a mated queen. Let's say you did a walk away split or something like that. Now in most of us learned in, in uh, high school biology, you know, the difference between uh, sex determination. And in most animals, you know, if you have two X chromosomes, you're a female. And if you're an X and a Y, then you, you turn out to be a male. Well, it doesn't work that way in bees and, and some other insects. In bees, we have what we call haplodiploidy. Uh, the queen bee, or also the worker bees, have two sets of chromosomes. Uh, they're diploid, but the male bees, the drone, they only have one set of chromosomes. They're haploid. So when a drone mates with a queen, all females get half of their genes from their father and half of the genes from the mother. So that's not so, uh, you know, that's not so surprising. That's what happens in other animals. But the weird part is, if the egg is unfertilized, then those eggs will become a drone. And the drones get their genetics only from their mother. They have no father. Uh, you know, when I tell this to, to non-beekeepers, you know, I say the drone bees have no father. They only have a mother. You know, a lot of folks say, well, well, that's weird. Well, it's not weird. It's nature. It's the way that things are. Uh, but this also can result in some interesting and unusual uh, aspects of breeding. You know, essentially the drones are uh, flying genetic packages of genes from their mother only. And so you really need to think about that when you're trying to cross... Uh, say two different colonies of bees, you're really crossing the queens and the drones are simply the packages in which those genetics are delivered uh, to the virgin queen and eventually to her female offspring. So female bees, workers and queens, come from a fertilized egg and they have 32 chromosomes, 16 from their mother, uh, 16 from their father. 
But male bees come from an unfertilized egg, so they have only 16 chromosomes. They have no father, as I just mentioned. And instead of sex chromosomes, X or Y, as in other species, honeybees, what they call sex alleles, a CSD, complementary sex determiner gene. And so with a fertilized egg with two different sex alleles, uh, one from the father, one from the mother, will be a worker most of the time, or if it's raised by the bees, uh, it can be a queen. An unfertilized egg has only one sex allele, and that would be a normal drone. But sometimes, hopefully rarely, you can have a fertilized egg with two identical sex alleles, a, otherwise known as a diploid drone. So this drone has two chromosomes, the same as a worker or a queen, but because the sex determiner uh, allele is the same, it'll only be a diploid drone. Now this is uh, not, in nature, this, these do not exist. The bees will eat the eggs or the newly emerged uh, larva right away, and the only way you can raise these type of drones is, is within the lab through breeding experiments. So uh, this does not exist in nature. But the problem is, and I'll cover this more in a little in a, in a moment, if there, you have a lot of these eggs, a lot of these uh, sex alleles that are similar, such as if you are inbreeding your bees, you, you will have a brood, a pattern that's irregular because a lot of these might will not be uh, viable. What I'm talking about is if, if you have, a, in, in nature, ideally you have not one drone mating with a queen, but many drones, but just taking this one drone as an example, uh, he mated with this uh, queen. Um, the queen will produce from unfertilized eggs her own drones with her own genetics, the red and the yellow, just to try to make it simpler, and the eggs that are fertilized with the drone some will be workers or they could be queens um, if they're raised and again no, no queen is going to mate with only one drone but i'm just trying to simplify it for you those are viable see because they're they're heterozygote they have different sex alleles so you will when the bees are unrelated there's no loss due to inbreeding of course in nature a queen is going to meet, mate with many drones and so if she happens to mate with one or two that are related to her that's not such a big deal uh, but if she's only mating with a few drones, and many of them or more of them are related to her, uh, that's going to be a problem. How so? Well, in this situation, the drone is related to the queen. He has the same sex allele as the queen. Now, she'll produce drones normally uh, based uh, on, on her offspring. But then, with the fertilized eggs, some of them will be heterozygous and so that one will be a viable egg to be a worker or possibly a queen but if they are the same that's homozygous and that'll be non-viable and so if the queen say mated with only one single drone maybe you're doing a breeding experiment or something like that uh 50 percent of her offspring will be non-viable and be lost So in the real world, obviously that's not going to happen. The queen mates with many drones, but if, if those colonies that are in the area are closely related to her, there might be sex alleles that are similar. And if there's only two sex alleles in the population, you'll only have 50% brood survival, and it can go, cause a, a poor brood pattern such as this. Now, of course, there's many reasons to have a poor brood pattern such as this. Uh, it could be mite collapse. It could be a brood disease, you know, European fowl brood. Um, you know, many things can do this. So if you see a, a poor brood pattern, that does not mean that it's from inbreeding or brood non-viability, but it is one cause, and that's especially a problem if you're breeding queens from the same lines over and over again, and there's not a lot of feral bees to put drones up into the uh, into the drone congregation areas. You don't have any neighbors nearby um, to have unrelated bees. And so ideally, you should have at least 10 or 12 different number of sex alleles in your population to ensure having a, a good amount of brood survival. So what do bees do to try to minimize the chances of inbreeding from happening? For one, I already alluded to, the queens try to mate with as many drones as possible. Uh, 
This is from Glenn Apiary's website. It's a really useful image showing that, you know, a queen might mate with 10 or 20 drones, and ideally most of them are unrelated or not closely related, and so you can get a whole variety of offspring. Queens try to mate further away from their colony than, uh, than the drones do. Uh, the drones tend to fly closer to the drone congregation areas, uh, and by going further away, they're more likely to find drones that they're less likely to be as closely related to. And then finally, honeybees have a much greater rate of genetic recombination than other species do. Well, what is recombination? Well, I've oversimplified it a bit to try to make my point. Um, but thinking about normal reproduction in you know most other species, you've got the boy and you've got the girl, you got the dad, you got the mother, and they each submit a chromosome, and the offspring has uh, you know half of their chromosomes are from one and half from the other. Uh, fairly simple. But in recombination, you have things getting all mixed up. You know normally the chromosome stay or the gen genes stay on the same chromosome, but in recombination they move over. And there's many ways that, that this happens. I'm going to show crossing over because it's easier to show. But there's actually many other ways that this happens. And it's beyond the scope of this presentation to go into all of them. Uh, just understand that it does happen, even if you don't understand how it does happen. And in crossing over, the chromosomes cross over, or the genes cross over to other arms of the chromosome. So it gets mixed up. In honeybees, recombination is about five times more often than in m many other insects, and about 20 times more often than in humans and other mammals. So, you know, when we think about it, you know, you think if you think about the genetics that you inherit from your parents as the cards that you are dealt, uh, you know, the, the cards can be shuffled around. You can get new cards into your deck with each generation as there's mating occurring and sharing of, of genes. But the, the cards themselves stay the same. There's not any moving around. You know, a, a queen of hearts is a queen of hearts. Uh, you know, and, and what happens in recombination is the bits and pieces of the DNA, bits and pieces of the genes are actually moved around onto the chromosomes. And so over time, the cards themselves change. And so that's really good to avoid inbreeding problems and it's good for genetic diversity. But as a bee breeder, that makes it extremely complicated to keep track of these things. And that's one reason why polygenetic traits such as Varroa mite resistance are really difficult to maintain in an open mated population long term. We can breed bees that have some variable rates of, of Varroa mite tolerance and some of them are actually quite tolerant. Uh, but if you're not doing breeding in a closed population, if you're not doing instrumental insemination, eventually over time, and actually fairly quickly amount of time, uh, a lot of these genetics will be lost unless there's an extremely strong uh, you know, selection pressure to maintain that. Okay, enough about genetics. Like I said, this is supposed to be a more of a basic uh, presentation about queen bees. So let's get back to the basics. Well, as the queen is walking around, you know, on the comb, she, she looks into the cell and she decides what type of egg will be laid. Uh, she can, she first makes sure that the cell is empty. And then if it's a worker cell, she'll lay a fertilized egg in there. Uh, or if it's a wider cell, if it's a drone cell, she will decide to lay a, a, a non-fertilized egg. And they've proven that the queen does this by with her front legs. Uh, they've done some experiments, and this sounds a bit cruel, honestly, if you ask me, where they snipped off the, the queen's front legs. Um, she could still walk around, she could still lay eggs, but she was not able to determine if they, she needed to lay a worker, a fertilized egg into this cell, or a drone, an under fertilized egg, and the, the cell pattern just got really irregular and messed up. And, uh, you know, that's not a experiment that I would really ever want to do, but somebody did it, so at least we have that understanding. And then the bees themselves decide what to do with it. Now, if they ha lost their queen and now they have an emergency impulse to raise a queen, they could pick any worker egg or any, any female egg, fertilized egg, that is not yet uh, emer or hatched. And, and once it hatches, feed it and raise it up into a, uh, into a queen if they so choose. Um, and Or the, they could remove it. So how is a queen bee created? So both queens and workers come from fertilized eggs. All larvae are fed jelly, but the 
components of that jelly changes over time. Uh, the queen bee is fed royal jelly her entire life. Uh, she receives more feeding visits and is fed more. Not only is she fed a different type of jelly, but she's also fed much more than the worker larva. Royal jelly is complex. It has water, proteins, sugars, lipids, fatty acids, and micronutrients. I don't know if you've ever tried it. I've tasted royal jelly when I'm out in the field and I had a little bit from a queen cell I didn't need. It's a little bit bitter. It's not really a very pleasant taste. Uh, some folks attribute, you know, sort of magical properties to it for humans that really hasn't been shown. But for us as, as beekeepers, it is very important that there is sufficient royal jelly being fed to queen bees, especially when we begin breeding queen bees and we want the bees to raise maybe more queen cells than they normally would raise out in nature. It's very important that there's a copious amount of royal jelly being fed to our, our uh, larvae that are developing into queens. So there's been a lot of thoughts as to what and how does do do the the larvae that otherwise would be workers somehow develop into queens, and it's always been thought to be something due to or related to the royal jelly. And at least one study found that there's a component, a protein called royal actin, that is the cause of the queen. Uh, the female larva to develop into a queen and this is showing what happened when they fed royal lactin to a uh, a fruit fly a female fruit fly they became larger had larger ovaries lived longer and so that is what they thought was the sole reason as to why queen bees can be raised from worker bees by being fed the royal jelly because of this protein called royal lactin of course with many things science things are usually not that simple. It, it's usually a little bit more complicated. Other investigators haven't been able to repeat some of these original relactin experiments. Those of you that know scientific research know that replication is essential. Just because one person or one group of investigators found something, it's not really proven until others can replicate it. And when there's, uh, when it's not able to be replicated or replicated, uh, you know, consistently, then you begin questioning. You know, is it is it really real? And others have found that it's been possible to raise larvae into queens on royal jelly in which the royal actin has been removed. And so it, it's probably not as simple as only being that one compound. And as, as you'd expect, it's complicated. Well, back to what the bees do. They decide to raise queens because of one of the following reasons, three general reasons. Emergency, the queen died or was lost. Uh, with managed honeybee colonies, it's you know I hate to say this, but it's because we maybe were clumsy, we squashed the queen, uh, maybe we rolled her as we were moving the frames around, or maybe she fell off the comb. I see that happen at least a couple of times a year that I know of, and there's probably times that I don't know that the queen just fell out of the hive, and then I come back then you know two weeks later and there's queen cells and she's gone. And what happened? It well, it might have been me in my clumsiness. As a queen gets older, her brood pheromone decreases her fertility decreases her ability to lay eggs decrease the queens know or the bees know that and they decide to replace their old queen through the supersedure impulse and then the third method it, or reason is swarming you know in the springtime there's a lot of things in bloom a lot of incoming floral resources the hive has a lot of population just like any other species it, it's important to reproduce uh, to produce the next generation and so the hive itself uh, may decide to swarm. I have a whole presentation about swarming behavior and management where I go into this in much greater detail. And as queen bee breeders, all of our methods make use of at least one or more of these natural instincts. So it's important to keep that in mind as we start going through and talking about the different methods and techniques that we use to raise queen bees. Okay, let's take a little break for a minute, and this is a little question and answer, uh, especially helpful for new beekeepers. I want to point out that this, the pictures that I have selected are the obvious ones. In the real world, when you're looking at a comb and you see a queen cell or, or a half dozen queen cells, it's not always quite as obvious or easy as this. I'm, I'm putting these pictures up to make a point, and I pick the easiest ones, but in the real world, it might not be quite as simple. Okay, so what are these? Multiple small queen cells usually throughout the face of the comb. Uh, extra hint, maybe there's not really any new eggs having been laid that you can find. 
uh, in general, these might represent emergency queen cells. So they're multiple, frequently on the face of the comb, and there's no eggs present or only a few, and in, in another day or two they are emerging. So that means that the queen had been removed or accidentally killed, maybe by you or maybe for other reasons. Well, what kind of queen cell is this? They're usually relatively large, uh, fewer in number. We tend to see them from midsummer through late summer. Supersedure cells. They tend to be fewer in number than emergency or swarm cells. They often are on the face of the comb, but not always. Uh, larger than emergency queen cells in size. The bees basically are able to take their time to raise these queens to make sure that they're well fed and often eggs are still present and indeed you might actually see the old queen uh, uh, walking around on, the, on a neighboring comb. Well what about these? Lots of cells they tend to be on the bottom of the, of, of the, of the combs again not always uh, they tend to occur more in the spring and early summer. These are swarm cells. They tend to be numerous larger than emergency queen cells, often on the bottom of the comb, but not always. Eggs may or may not be present. You know, it really depends. You know, if the if the queen and is getting if they're getting ready to fly, the sort they will will not allow her to lay eggs. They want her to reduce her body weight. Or if the swarm has already flown off, then you won't, might not see any eggs either. These photos that I've given you again, these are the best photos I could find as the best examples. In the real world, it's not always as easy. It's not always as cut and dried. So keep that in mind. What about these queen cells? You know, they have holes in them. So the one on the left is an emerged queen cell. You can see and where her little, uh, where she had gnawed her way out. And sometimes you can actually even see the trap door still in place. It's always cool to see these. So that is where a queen has emerged. So you probably have a virgin queen running around in that colony. Um, and so even if you might not see eggs, there may be a queen and it might take a little bit of time, uh, maybe another couple of weeks before you see eggs. Now, the queen cell on the right has the hole on the, not on the tip, but on the side. That's a destroyed queen cell. That can be because a virgin had uh, emerged first and then went and opened up the sides and stung to death her sisters. Sometimes the bees themselves will decide that, oh, I, we don't need, need this queen. We don't need this queen cell. Maybe we have enough or, or we, we already have a queen. And the, the bees themselves take it down too. So a hole in the side does not always mean that it was a virgin queen that came in and killed her sister, but it certainly could mean it. Now, sometimes new beekeepers post photos like this. You know, what, what kind of queen cells are these? Uh, do I have to worry about swarming? Uh, these are what we call queen cell cups. Uh, so these are where a queen cell would be uh, if the need ever arises. And they're normal to see in the colony at all times of the year. But most commonly in the springtime, as the swarming season approaches, the bees will kind of polish these out and kind of get them ready. Uh, once an egg is laid in these, then they are what we consider to be a queen cell. They're not a queen cup. Uh, it's not a queen cell until there's an egg or larva present. So it doesn't really mean the hive is going to swarm, but you need to keep an eye on them. And there really is no point in removing these or cutting these out because, you know, th these, they're, they're not a queen cell. And, and so they're just going to rebuild them, uh, you know, very quickly, probably even within a day or even a few hours. The queens emerge from their cells around day 16 after the egg was laid. In warmer weather and temperatures, they may emerge a little bit earlier, like a half day earlier. Uh, after she emerges and hardens up a little bit, she will seek out other queens. Uh, if they're still in the cell, then she will open that up and destroy them. If two virgins um, uh, emerge at the same time, they may fight. Sometimes the bees will keep them separate. You know, for example, if, if the hive is in the process of swarming, they, they don't want them to kill each other. Uh, maybe the hive will throw out after swarms, after the prime swarm with the original mother queen, you know, flies away. They might actually have secondary swarms with, with virgin queens. And so they might not let them kill each other until the very end, until they decide, okay, we've swarmed enough. And now, now we can, uh, you know, just have one queen. Sometimes you can hear them piping or tooting. 
making little sounds while they're in the in this queen cells. It's a very wonderful sound. I, if you've if you've ever heard it, um, you know you'll you'll never forget it. If you have never heard it, I, I recommend you know googling it or getting on YouTube. And there's there's little videos of uh, the queen bees piping, so you can understand what that sound is. But you can hear it even ten feet away from the colony without it even opened up. And you're walking through your apiary, you can hear them sometimes uh, piping, and that's it's pretty neat. The development and metamorphosis of a queen bee uh, basically is through the following process. The eggs hatch on day three like any other egg. Um, she's a larva from day three to day uh, eight and a half. The queen cell is capped at day seven and a half. Um, from, and this is counting from when the egg was laid. Uh, from the egg emerges, um, uh, from the egg hatching, then it's going to be around day four and a half to five. Uh, she's a pupa from day eight until she emerges. Uh, the date of emergence, again, this is counting back from the day the egg was laid. Uh, when we're grafting, we might count differently. We're counting from the day that the egg hatches. Uh, but emergence from the day the egg was laid would be day 15 and a half through day 17. She goes on mating flights from starting around day 5 to 7 after she is emerging. And then about three days later, she will begin laying eggs. And so that's why if you're doing walkaway splits, you need to keep in mind it might be almost a month before you see eggs. After emerging, she waits a few days before going on her mating flights. And around day seven, sometimes a little earlier, sometimes later, if the weather is bad and cold and rainy, she might not go on mating flights, even as long as a week after she emerged, uh, after she would normally go. Obviously, if it's cold weather for weeks and weeks, that's a problem. She'll never mate, and then she'll end up being a drone layer. But generally, around a week after she had emerged from her cell, she leaves the hives to fly, fly to drone congregation areas, or DCAs for short, which is where mating uh, takes place. These areas tend to be in the same location year after year. Uh, they don't have a good understanding as to why. Uh, they have studied these locations for four decades in the same location and they tend to always be in the same place even though no bee will ever go back to a DCA in its lifetime. The drones of course don't live long enough. Um, the ones that mate of course die in the process and most of them that don't mate you know they are not going to go back the following year because they don't live that long. Uh, the queen bees you know they are even though they might live for multiple years they're not going to go back because after they're mated they never go back to mate again. And typically the, the DCAs are in sunny wind protected areas or what we call depressions of the horizon. So if you live in a place where there's hills or forest, it, the, the, they might be uh, in the valley between the hills or they might be in, a, in an area where the forest, there's a break in the forest like a meadow, for example, or a trail or a roadway through the forest. As many as 10,000 to 15,000 drones may be flying in any DCA on any given summer day. Uh, the virgins will fly out to these and mate with an average of 10 to, or 12 to 14 drones. And afterwards, she returns to the hive and begins laying eggs about three days later. If she hasn't gotten enough sperm, she might go out mating another time or two. But once she begins laying, she'll never fly out to go mating ever again. As I alluded to in earlier in the presentation, drones tend to fly closer to their colony average distance of about a half a mile, where the queens tend to fly farther away from their colonies than the drones. Uh, by doing this, this helps prevent inbreeding or minimize it. There was a study in the United Kingdom found that 90% of queens were within four and a half miles, but the furthest recording, uh, recorded mating was 9.3 miles away. Another study in Ontario showed they studied various distances up to 14 miles. These were places where no feral bees, no managed colonies existed, and they were able to completely control you know, how far the drone uh, colonies were from the queens. Uh, they found that some went as far as 10 point miles away, uh, although obviously there were many queens in that situation which didn't mate at all. Uh, that's really amazing to think about it. You know, The queen has to fly that far she's not going to fly there and then turn around and come back. She's going to have to be there and get mated um, and then come back. That's a huge distance for a queen bee to, to do. Uh, it, it makes sense if, if inbreeding is such a bad thing for, uh, for honeybees to fly further than that. 
It also makes sense from the drone's perspective to stay closer to home. Why? Well, you know, the drones up there cruising around in the drone congregation area, most of them will not meet a queen, and he only has so much energy to expend before he has to go back to the hive and get some honey and rest up and fly again. So flying close to the col- his colony makes sense because it's going to increase the amount of time that he's going to be up there flying in the drone congregation area and possibly win the lottery of meeting a virgin queen. Uh, drones will also sometimes go back to colonies that are not their own and they can sometimes be found found at dcas many miles away from their original home colony and the way they do that is they they like some uh bachelors they just don't really care where they spend the night and they may spend their night at different colonies and slowly over time they actually become further away from the original colony where they were raised After mating, the queen has basically two jobs. She's got to lay eggs and produce queen pheromone, otherwise known as queen substance. They can live up to two to four years, although in managed colonies we may not keep them around that long. Uh, you know, and she's basically an egg-laying machine, and despite her name as the queen bee, she really has no decision-making capacity. The worker bees make all the decisions in the hive. Queens produce pheromones, which are chemicals uh, to stimulate, communicate to the other bees in the colony. There's two important ones, queen retinue pheromone and then queen mandibular pheromone. The retinue pheromone attracts the worker bees who surround the queen, uh, feed her, uh, clean her. The queen mandibular pheromone is important for hive uh, reproduction, but it's also important for mating. So it actually is what the virgin queen produces that attracts the drones for when they're up flying in the air to mate. What's interesting though is the drones completely ignore this pheromone when it's crawling around within the hive, which kind of makes sense. They never mate in the hive, and so the drones just know not to pay attention to that signal when it's found from their queen in the hive. The other thing too is if there if a hive is queenless the bees will know that within minutes and this video right here kind of shows you how the bees are acting they're fanning they're scenting their uh their nasonov glands are, are are exposed and this is how a cell starter should look prior to putting the grafted queen cell cups in there but if you open a just a normal colony and you see the bees buzzing like that that's a, that's a signal that maybe this hive is queenless now of course you need to open them up and check to make sure but there's a good chance you might open that hive when that's fanning like this to find a bunch of emergency queen cells and uh you know what happened maybe you were the you know you accidentally uh, killed the queen the other day when you were in there or maybe something else happened uh sometimes you can see bees fanning like that when they actually have queens raised the virgin queen is out on her mating flight and they're scenting so that she can more easily find her way back So before we get into the more advanced topics of bee breeding that we'll cover in the other presentations, uh, I, I want to go over some of the basics that new beekeepers need to learn. Uh, you don't have to find your queens, you know, as much as we like to find them, you don't have to find them. Uh, but sometimes it is important, you know, when you're requeening or, or doing making splits and things like that, then it is more important. But you don't have to see her every time uh, you open the hive. You can tell a great deal about how the hive is doing in the queen without actually seeing her. But there are situations when you must find the queen, requeening obviously, making splits. Uh, some swarm prevention methods require you to find the queen and, and move her to another pl uh, hive or location. If you're going to mark or cage her, you obviously need to be able to find her as well. So here's some rules of thumb to help you uh, when you're trying to locate the queen. Rule number one, the queen is where the eggs and young larvae are. Usually, uh, you know, all rules are meant to be broken. I've uh, gone into colonies and I opened the brood nest trying to find a queen and couldn't find her, couldn't find her. Turned out she was up on the inner cover, uh, uh, two or three honey supers up, nowhere close to the brood nest. Sometimes they will move around. Not usually, but, you know, so like all rules of thumb, they are frequently broken and not followed. Rule number two, you know, rather than looking at each individual bee, take a general overview of the entire comb. Sometimes you'll get lucky and spot her at a glance. 
it's not like you're looking for the queen herself but trying to look for what is different it's sort of like looking at the whole forest and seeing you know that which is different and it, sometimes she'll just jump out at you by just looking at the whole comb and as you get more experience as a beekeeper um, you'll it, the queens will just pop out at you you'll just see them uh, without really looking at every every single bee rule number three the queens tend to move differently than than the worker bees you know where the worker bees are moving around and the queen bee walks more deliberately and slowly she's looking for a place to lay eggs the exception is virgin queens they're smaller than but they also tend to behave more like a worker bee and it's not until she's made it and begins laying eggs where she calms down another thing that new beekeepers sometimes don't know is the queen is not always the biggest bee i mean she's the longest bee frequently especially a mated queen uh, but the drones can often be bigger or wider you know sometimes i'm opening a hive and i'm looking for the queen and i've got a new beekeeper with me and they're like is that the queen uh nope that's a drone is that the queen nope that's a drone um is that the queen nope please keep your mouth shut let's look for the queen <laughs> And don't tell me until you are sure. Um, and that again, you know, getting your your queen eyes on to to really find those queens and not be distracted by drones or whatnot. That just comes with experience, and that just comes with time. Just getting out there and and studying and observing your bees. Rule number four, you know, if you don't see the queen right away, you know, look at different sections of the comb, then look for parts of the queen you know it's not always like those photos you often see online you know the perfect photo sometimes she can be hidden under the bees she can have her head uh, uh in in a cell or in a in a crack between the combs so look for a shiny abdomen extending past her wings uh and sometimes they'll just pop out at you this was a march queen i covered up her little blue spot um to show you uh you know where she is um, but if she was an unmarked queen it would have been much harder to uh, see her And then finally, if you just can't find the queen, sometimes it's best just close up and come back later, sometimes 15 or 20 minutes later or sometimes the next day. Uh, maybe she's on the side walls of the hive and she's not even on a comb um, or somewhere else. Try to use minimal smoke and disturb your hives as little as possible when looking for the queen. And as you go through the brood nest, you know, remove the combs you've already looked at and put them in a safe place like a spare nuke box. Some queens are hiders. They like to hide. They'll crawl, poke their heads into cells so you can't see them. Or they'll uh, go into a crevice at the end of the frame. Other queens are more nervous. I call them sneaky runners. They'll run off and they'll try to hide on the hive walls or the bottom board. I've had them run up into honey supers like I had mentioned. And then finally, if you still can't find her, you might decide to do some other techniques like putting a, a queen excluder between the brood nest, coming back a few days later. And after four days, the box that has the eggs in is where the queen is. And so at least that's helped you know which box she is in. And for some methods like swarm prevention and things like that, that might be enough. You might just remove the box. You know the queen is in there. You don't actually have to find her. Uh, but if you do have to find her for requeening, at least you know, you, you know you've cut down the number of combs that you're going to have to look at. Okay, requeening. Well, should you requeen, and if so, how often? What time of year should you requeen? And then some other questions. What type of queen? How was the queen bred? How was the queen assessed before she was sold? Was she banked? Should you mark or clip, or clip your queen's wings? So how often should you requeen? There are various opinions regarding requeening. One option is just let nature take its course. I mean, the bees have been doing this now for, for as long as there have been honeybees. Requeen every year. When I first started out as a new beekeeper back in the 80s, it was pretty much a given that everybody would requeen every year. Whether or not you should do that or need to do that really depends. Depends on your situation and maybe what you're trying to get out of beekeeping. We'll talk about that. Requeen every other year. Many queens have more than one year of productive life ahead of them, especially those of us who have bees up in the north where there's a brood break every winter. 
or you can requeen but only when needed. Well, let's go through and talk about all these different uh, methods of deciding to requeen or not. Doing nothing, letting nature take its course, it's inexpensive. You don't have to buy queens. You don't have to even find the queen. This is what bees have been doing for thousands of years, millions of years even. Disadvantages, you don't have any control of the bees in your hives. If you're in a place where there's Africanized bees, this is really not a good option because your bees will become Africanized at some point. Uh, if the queen fails or dies or the bees try to raise a queen and they fail, you've lost the entire hive. So that is expensive. Requeening every year has many advantages. You know, young queens are more productive. They lay more eggs, produce more bees. A larger colony, all things being equal, will produce more honey. Young queens will be less likely to swarm. And there's some data to suggest that young queens might be less, uh, hives with young queens might be less likely to die over the winter. Disadvantage, if you're requeening all of your hives without looking at your queens, there might be some good queens that will be replaced. And if you're not raising your own queens but buying them, there's a chance that you might buy a queen that's actually worse than one that you just removed out of the hive. That actually is what happened to me and why I eventually be decided to start raising my own queens. If I'm going to requeen, I would like to know that the queen that I'm putting in there is better than the queen that I'm removing. There's time, cost of replacement. Um, and if you're planning on you know, breeding queens, there's really not enough time to assess which queens should be kept for breeding or not. Every other year requeening, it's less expensive. And if you're intending on breeding queens, two years gives you some more time to assess which queens you want to keep for breeding and which you would like to get rid of. There might be less honey production from a two-year-old versus one-year-old queen, and a hive with a two-year-old queen is definitely more likely to swarm all things being equal as compared to one that has a, a, a young queen in it. Requeen, but only when needed. It has the same advantages of requeening every other year. Uh, if you are a backyard beekeeper and you only have a few hives, uh, this, this can make sense. Uh, you need to pay more close attention to your hives. And the, the other issue with this is once a queen is failing, you might decide I need a backup queen right away. But if you don't have one on hand, you know, it might be, you know, it might be too late by the time you can order one in and get one in to, to replace that failing queen. So here's what I do. In general, I requeen my production colonies every other year. I don't send my hives to California for almond poll pollination or anywhere else and they get a really nice brood break every winter. And because of that, many good queens have more than one year of production in them. I'm also a queen breeder too, so I would like to have all my colonies go at least two years. Uh, you know, everything, you know, as long as, as they're, the queen is doing what it need, she needs to be doing, uh, I'll give them at least two years before I decide which one I'm going to possibly keep for breeding and which one I'm going to requeen. It goes without saying, if there's issues, there's a poor brood pattern, the hive is defensive, they're unproductive, I'm going to requeen them as, as soon as I possibly can. Uh, I'm not going to let that hive go. You know, wait, waiting and hoping for things to change is really very poor bee, bee, beekeeping. Um, as soon as you realize a queen has issues, it's time to requeen her, the first opportunity you have to get a new queen, which is yet another reason why it's good to be producing even even your own queens just a small number for your own use so that you have them on hand for when you need them now for those queens i'm thinking about saving for potential breeding stock you know i like to have them over winter for at least two winters in addition to meeting all of the other selection criteria and i'll talk about what my selection criteria are in another presentation so i guess the question is what should you do it honestly really depends on what your reasons are for keeping bees. If you're a commercial beekeeper and you're interested in honey production and you honestly do not have enough time to go through every colony and evaluate each queen individually, it makes sense to requeen every year. I know some beekeepers are even requeening twice a year. On the other hand, if you're a backyard beekeeper with only a few hives, you can look at every queen and decide, you know, I'll requeen that one and that other one maybe not. And then someone like me, uh, you know, I have criteria that I use to keep queens and not, um, but I might not be requeening every year, perhaps every other year, unless a queen has problems, then obviously I'm going to requeen as soon as I can. So what time of year should you requeen? 
traditionally most of us requeened in the spring or early summer and there's advantages to that if you're a new beekeeper colonies are smaller it's easier to find the old queen you have the entire summer to assess her uh, if if the queen fails you have the entire summer to get a new queen and if you're ordering in queens from elsewhere they're more available in the spring and early summer disadvantage of course is queens must be ordered in from elsewhere if spring weather was poor for mating you might get a poorly mated queen uh, you know I raise my, my own queens and I sell them to local beekeepers but I get phone calls in April do you have any queens available I don't even have any drones available at, in, to mate with my queens and there's a foot of snow on the ground um, you know it's just not possible to produce queens that that early uh, but if so if you need if you want to requeen early in the spring you know early summer you're gonna be having to order them in from elsewhere but more recently more of us are requeening later if you want to have a local uh, queen in the north you're more likely to find her in the summer to late summer uh, the weather is going to be warmer better for mate it, mating and she's more likely to be well mated you can make nukes to overwinter I'm not covering that in this presentation but I do in some other presentations but later in the year not as many queens are available if you're wanting to order them in say from California you might have trouble finding queens at that point the hives are much more populous so it is going to be harder to find the old queen amongst all those bees and if you requeen late summer and that she fails you don't have that much time to, to you know to realize that and to order in a new queen so some additional questions to ponder you're going to order a queen but what type of queen should you have there's many options some beekeepers well many beekeepers have strong opinions as to what the best type of bee there is to raise but you know it honestly depends you know if you were gonna get into cattle you know raising cows you know you have many choices you know what, what kind of cow is the best this kind well maybe if you are wanting to, to be a dairy farmer and produce milk or what about this kind well sure if you were going to breed beef cattle this this uh, bull might be a nice uh, nice source of genetics to add to your herd or what about this well maybe if you were in the south or the southwest where the temperatures are very hot you might want to put some of those genetics into your herd or maybe these these are very tough you know they lived f f as feral cattle for quite a long time in the southwest and in Texas or maybe you want one of these you know if you were living in the far north and you wanted cattle that could live outside in all kinds of storms and weather maybe that's the kind of cow so there really is no one best type of cow there isn't really one best type of bee how was the queen assessed before being sold you know many queen producers use mini mating nukes that has the advantage of not requiring a lot of bees to make up but in such a tiny colony you know they're not going to be assessing brood pattern before they they sell that queen as soon as they see the first eggs she's going to be caught caged and sent off to the new beekeeper so those queens that are shipped as first as soon as the first eggs are laid usually around day 14 to 21 after the the cell is placed in the nuke they're the least expensive of queens that are available but all you know is the queen just started to lay eggs you don't know if she made it I mean she could be a drone layer that doesn't happen very often but it, it does and occasionally even in my queens it does as well and that's why I like to wait a little longer to know that these are not you know these are well mated and that they're actually producing worker eggs so that's a little bit longer you have to wait until the first capped brood those queens are uh, take are you know a little bit more money because there's you know that you could have been producing more queens during that time but instead you had waited longer but you can assess if she's mated you know she's not a drone layer does she have a good brood pattern and so on you're not really ex assessing anything else I mean there's not enough time to assess what her workers will be like back in the day back in the 80s you could get tested or select tested Queens these were even more money basically you could get a better idea of the characteristics of her offspring so you had you, these were kept for at least one full turnover of population so not only are you knowing that the queen is good but also that her work the workers are you know whatever you're selecting for you even if it's just as simple as defensiveness you know they're gentle bees and all of that these really are not available for sale very much anymore if at all 
And then finally, for those of us like myself who are queen bee breeders, I might want to bring in a breeder queen from another breeder that was instrumentally inseminated just so that I can know that, you know, she does have the genetics that uh, that I, I, I want, you know, whether it's a uh, varroa specific hygiene or whatnot. So here's another question that uh, some beekeepers find controversial, especially queen clipping. Should you mark or clip your queens? You know, marking helps you find uh, queen bees much more easier. I mark all of my queens. I sell bees to uh, queen bees to new beekeepers, and I have dark queens that are harder to find. And plus, I want to know if the queen in the hive is the same one as I think she is. If she was replaced by the bees, that's fine. If it's one of her daughters, but it's I like to know that from from a genetic uh, honeybee breeding standpoint. There is an international uh, code for marking queen bees. Um, it's white, yellow, red, green, blue. I, I remember it with this following mnemonic. Will you raise good bees? Uh, now, you don't, you can paint them any color you want. Fluorescent, you know, orange or purple, pink. Uh, if, especially if you're not selling them. You can mark them the same color every year, although you won't know which year they're they were made it in but as long as you know what those colors mean you know it's up to you myself as a as someone who sells queen bees to other beekeepers i really do try to follow this marking code because it is standardized and it's accepted uh, throughout the world learning to mark queens is not all that difficult i recommend practicing on drones first although use a color that none of your queens are marked with um, I did this uh, one year when I was first learning, and then I let all the drones go, and I was seeing queens everywhere. They weren't queens. They were the drones that you know were crawling around on the combs. And what was interesting, though, is I, I caught the drones from one colony, um, and very quickly those drones were in all of my different colonies. So drones are not very loyal to wherever hive they were raised. They, they are, like I said, they're bachelors. They, they'll, they'll spend the night anywhere they can find a place that will let them sleep uh, for the night. Um, try to mark only the thorax. Avoid the head, wings, and abdomen. Uh, you know, be aware that honeybees breed out of spiracles on the side of their thorax, and if you cover that up with uh, with paint, they won't be able to breathe, and she can die. Now, there's many devices and gadgets for marking queens. I've tried them all. Um, you know, I, I, I they can all work. You just got to be really careful that you don't actually pinch or kill the queen. Um, I've done that. I was trying to grab the queen, and I ended up, you know, squashing her. The best way to do it, if you're going to mark any number of queens, is just to to learn how to do it, you know, by picking her up with 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 uh, with your bare hands. Um, it's a little intimidating at first, uh, like anything else. You have to reach right into a hive with your bare hands. But once you get into practice, it's actually not that hard. Uh, you pick her up by the thorax or by the wings. You really try not to ever grab her by the abdomen. It, they're very delicate. And if you're too rough, you can damage her, possibly even kill her. Here's a little video showing, um, you know, I picked the queen up and now how I'm going to mark her. Uh, sorry, it's a little out of focus. I was trying to mark using the viewfinder on my camera on my phone. So, um, you know, it, but basically you just put a drop of, a drop, drop, drop of paint right on the, her back of a th her thorax, let it dry for a, a few seconds and then put her back into the colony. Well, where marking queens with paint is more accepted, clipping is a little bit more controversial. Um, some beekeepers would clip wings trying to prevent the swarm from leaving the area. The problem with that is usually she would end up in the grass, maybe with a little ball of bees, and not find her way back. And if you're not checking in front of your hives like every day, every few days, uh, you've now lost this queen, and they're going to swarm anyway the next time they can raise another queen, which is you know going to be one of the virgins, usually within a few days. So it's not very good at preventing swarming. Um, it does help uh, you keep track of, you know, by if you use alternate sides, one side is for uh, even years and one side is for uh, odd years. That can help you keep track on the year she was bred in, in case the paint gets uh, taken off, which the bees often do. You want to only clip off the lower third because if you clip off more, then the bees might think she is damaged. I don't do these in general for most of my queens, but I will for the really expensive, uh, the instrumentally inseminated queens Then I will so she doesn't fly off and I have at least a some chance of finding her or preventing her from swarming. But uh, ideally, those hives that are very expensive, I'm using a lot of techniques and I'm monitoring them very closely so that they don't swarm or, or get lost in another way. And for years, many beekeepers 
thought, including myself, that the clipping damages the queen, so there's increased rate of super seizure. But as it would turn out, that turns out not to actually be true. Uh, there was an old publication back from 1971 showing that clipped queens did not have an increased rate of super seizure. So, so there you go. Um, I, like I said, I don't generally clip my queens, but the very expensive instrumentally inseminated queens, I will, but not any of the other ones. Well, you know, before you are breeding queens, you need to know how to introduce queens into colonies uh, if you're requeening your, your colonies or, or whatnot. There's various methods on how to do this. One way, direct release, this is not recommended, a very high rate of rejection. Um, you know, if you have a, a mated queen that you just pulled out of her hive and you put her in and it's during a honey flow, you know, there's a chance they'll accept her, but you know, oftentimes that it won't happen. I sell queens to new beekeepers, and I've had several of them. You know, when I, I always ask them questions, you know, oh, you're requeening, and several of them, uh, I mean, surprisingly, oh, don't you just open the cage up and let her in the entrance, and then the bees take care of her? It's like that's not how it works. You have to remove the old queen and and then make sure that they accept the the new queen. A common way is uh, that we we use I and I use myself it, releasing from the sh shipping cage. Uh, these cages often come with candy. It takes a few days for the bees to eat through the candy. And then uh, if you, you recheck a few days later, if they haven't released her on her own and they seem to be nice, then you can release her manually. Uh, you can use a push-in cage. Um, this is for more expensive queens that you really want to be accepted. And, you know, especially when you bought a queen from elsewhere, you don't know if she was in a queen bank. You don't know how tough her journey was. Her ovarials have shrunk up. She's not producing queen pheromone as much. So if you put her on a comb and allow her a few days to start laying eggs, she's much more likely to be accepted. And then the method that I use for the really expensive, the instrumentally inseminated queens, I might, it's easier to introduce a queen into a smaller colony first and then into the larger colony. So I'll often introduce the really expensive, valuable queens to a small nuke first. Once she's laying, once she has eggs, once she has her own bees, then I can unite that nuke with the larger colony where I want her to end up. So the shipping cage, basically, as soon as you get the queens in the mail, um, you give them a small drop of water so they're not dehydrated. And if you can't put them in right away, it's okay for a short time, maybe even up to a couple of days, um, keeping her at room temperature out of the sun. But, you know, be aware, the longer she is out of the, the colony and not doing what queen bees should be doing, which is laying eggs, um, the harder it's going to be in, to introduce her overall. So the sooner you put her in the hive, the better. You can So you remove the covering over the candy and you place in the middle of the brood nest between combs of brood with the, the mesh facing towards the bees. You don't want to have it facing towards the comb. Nobody, you know, none of the bees can get to that. And that way, when they have access to the screen, they can start feeding her. They can start, uh, you know, getting used to her scent. Traditionally, a lot of be uh, books and beekeepers said you need to remove the attendants so that you'll have best acceptance. I have to be honest, you know, I never do that. But if you are going to remove the attendants, I can't stress this enough. Do this inside. Do it in a building next to a window. So if the queen accidentally flies out, she'll fly to the window and not go away. If you're at an out yard, do it inside your vehicle with the windows rolled up. Um, if you try to do it outside, you might have the queen fly out. You might not be fast enough, and goodbye. Uh, so if you, if, that, if you do want to remove the attendants, then, that's, then make sure you do it inside a vehicle or a, or a building with the windows closed. But I never do that, and I don't really have any problems with queen acceptance. After about three to five days, come back, make sure the queen is released. You know, look at how the bees are acting towards her, and if they're friendly, you know, you can just manually open it. Again, be careful. Make sure you point the opening downward so she doesn't fly away. And incidentally, if she does fly away when this happens, the best thing to do is to just walk away. Leave the hive open and walk away for 15, 20 minutes, and then come back and close it up. Um, look on your clothing. I've had uh, queens just fly, and I thought they flew away. They only just flew and landed on my clothing. They were She was one sitting on my shoulder. I look over, and there she was. And so I, I just gently picked her up and put her in the hive. And then also look around. If you see her fly off, like in a certain direction, you know, look around very carefully so you don't step on her. Sometimes you'll find her in the grass or on a small bush. Um, and sometimes you'll find a, a small cluster of bees uh, have found her, and you can find a little ball of bees and, and carry that gently back to the hive that you're trying to put her into. I really like the push-in cage method. 
it, it's much more likely to have success. Uh, basically, you find a, a comb of brood comb that has newly emerging brood. If there's a little bit of honey, uh, that so much the better, although that's not absolutely necessary. And then some open cells for her to begin laying. And what I do is, uh, first I brush off all the bees off the comb, um, and then I take it inside or inside my vehicle windows rolled up. I release the key, queen and maybe a couple of her attendants with her, so she's crawling the comb, and I push these uh, wire cages that I make out of number eight uh, wire cloth, and push them down firmly so it won't fall out and so that uh, you know it's it, there's no way for the bees to get under and I let her be in there for three to five days so she can start laying eggs um, I make sure when I put it back in the hive there's enough room for the bees to get all over uh, you might need to pull out one of the combs temporarily to, to allow there to be space until such time that you know the queen is released later and you can put that comb back Sometimes I, I sell queens to other beekeepers and, and they say that it, she was rejected. And, you know, I have, a, I have a, a few questions. There's different reasons for this. One is that the, the colony wasn't queenless. You know, maybe you thought your colony was queenless because you didn't see eggs, but the colony was in the process of queen replacement. Maybe they swarmed and there was a virgin queen and she wasn't laying yet. So you tried to put a new queen in and the bees were like, no, I don't think so. We already have one. Maybe the there wasn't enough time for the bees to get to know the queen. I've had very super large colonies eat through the candy in say one day and they didn't get to know the new queen and so they killed her and they decided they were gonna raise new queens from uh, from eggs from the previous old queen. So if you have a very strong colony, maybe I don't uncover the candy. I Maybe I give it a couple of days, two or three days and then I uncover the candy and then I, maybe I'll come back and, or you know, just wait, you know, five days and manually release her if they seem to be nice, you know, they're not, attacking the screen or trying to stink through the screen but they're acting you know very calm and they're scenting and they're fanning and and are friendly to the queen you might just you know just leave her in that cage without letting them eat through the candy so they have enough time another common problem is they you've had laying workers develop uh again i sell queens to new beekeepers and i ask you know how long have they been queenless oh i don't know about a month or so you know, are there eggs? Did you look? Well, I don't really know. You know, I'm hoping for the best. You know, and those, it's like if there's already laying workers, it's, it's you're not going to be able to just introduce a queen. There are ways to manage laying workers, but certainly it's difficult. And just trying to reintroduce a queen through the normal uh, methods, you know, often is unsuccessful. Sometimes certain types of bees don't like to have other types of bees. Uh, you know, if you're trying to introduce a, a Russian queen to a, a, a colony of Italian bees, or or more commonly, let's say you live in an Africanized area and you want to put in a European bee, they're going to be less likely to uh, want to, uh, you know, want to accept the, that queen. One way to ensure that is to make sure you destroy all the queen cells and all the eggs and give them enough time to where they're hopelessly queenless. What I mean is there are no eggs, no young larvae, and they cannot raise a new queen cell. At that point, you know, then they're much more likely to accept her. And then use one of the methods that I talked about, you know, introducing into a nuke first and then into that hive or, or using a push-in cage. Sometimes it could be a problem with the queen herself. Maybe the bees know that she's poorly mated. Maybe they know that she's diseased. Maybe the queen producer, they didn't tell you, but she was banked too long. You know, one week or so is okay, but, you know, they start getting banked three, four weeks longer. Not saying that it's impossible to introduce them, but it's much harder, and the bees are much, you know, they know there's something wrong with that queen, and they're less likely to accept her. So how do you maximize acceptance of newly introduced queens uh, and avoid these problems? Well, for one, make sure she's queenless at least 24 hours before you attempt introduction. Also, uh, just a word of advice, don't pinch the queen. If, if they say, oh, the queen's coming tomorrow, and you pinch the queen the day before, and it turns out she got stuck in the mail or she arrives dead, um, I don't ever pinch queens until the new queens are in my hand. I know I have them because otherwise you're going to be really stuck now. It's like, oh, sure, we'll send you a replacement, but uh, maybe in two weeks. Now you've got a problem. So don't pinch your queens before your new queens are in hand and you know they're alive and you know they're, you have them. Give the bees enough time to get let them know get to know their new queen. I already mentioned about the strong hive sometimes eating through the candy too quickly, so I might not uncover the candy until later, or you know wait until it's long enough to, has passed to do a manual release. Let the queen begin laying eggs uh, in a protected situation, like under a push-in cage or in a nuke first. Then introduce into the colony where you intend her to be.
If there's no honey flow, feeding syrup for a few weeks uh, often will improve uh, queen acceptance. And then before you release the queen, pay attention to how they're acting. You know, if they are crawling on the cage, you know, they're fanning, they're scenting, you know, they seem pretty happy and, you know, then they're likely to accept her. But if they're biting the wire and they're bending their abdomen almost as if they're trying to sting through the mesh, probably best not to try to introduce that queen. And if it's been several days, I might even go through and see if there's, you know, another queen in the hive. You know, be aware that some colonies, especially in the summer, up to 5 or 10% of them may have a second queen present in that colony. You know, the old rule that there can only be one queen in a colony is not always true. And some colonies might be in the process of supersedure that you don't know. The daughter queen may be present. The old queen may be present. You might pinch only one of them, try to introduce a new queen, and they'll they'll say, no, we don't want this new queen. We already have one. And after you've requeened, try, try to check them every week or two because sometimes they might accept her, but then they're like, you know, she's been in the cage for a while. I think we're going to raise a new queen anyway. They might actually use the eggs of the new queen. So the new queen may lay eggs, and a week or two later, they might decide to uh, to requeen this queen that you introduced with one of her daughters. And, and But that's going to set the hive back. It, I mean, they will raise a new queen, but it'll set back the hive and the population and especially if it's at the end of the year, winter is coming, that might not be a very good thing. So you might have to, you know, take some precautions, remove those supersedure cells, at least such time that the queen is laid enough and been thoroughly accepted by the, the colony. Well, that brings me to the end of the Queen Bee Basics and is a segue into the, the next series of presentations that I have. You know, for years, you know, many of us got used to, maybe even spoiled by being able to order in queens uh, from, you know, from all over. You know, even in the winter time, you can order queen bees in from Hawaii. And I'm going to be careful. I'm not trying to be negative about that. This is a really important and and very necessary service. I mentioned how you know beekeepers call me, say, "Hey, do you have any queens?" And it's April, and of course, I don't have any queens. It's there's snow on the ground. It's we just had a blizzard last week. That's where queen breeders in places like California and Hawaii are really necessary and provide a very valuable service and they can provi they can produce many many more queens than any of us small time local queen producers ever could produce but that said you know maybe those queens that were raised in Hawaii maybe they're not so good if you're intending to raise them throughout the year like in South Dakota or Minnesota or somewhere there's been a lot of changes in the commercial and queen bee and package bee production. We've had higher losses than in in, in the past, more cost for replacement and demand for queens and package bees to replace them. And many areas have become endemic for the Africanized honeybee. And if those queen bees are being open mated, you know, in places like Texas and other places where there's Africanized bees, that could be a real problem, of course. So in the future, we might see some of the following a trend towards more beekeepers raising their own replacements. I know uh, Dr. Larry Connor published a series of books and one of his books is Queen Bee Basics and really pushing for beekeepers to get back to what we used to do back in the day before we had, you know, airlines and uh, trucks to ship bees, you know, across the country. We had, we, beekeepers had to raise all of our own queens in our replacement. We really, really didn't have any choice. And there's also been a trend towards lo more locally raised queens from locally acclimated stock. I cover this in much greater detail in my other presentation, The Genetic Diversity of Honeybees and Why It's Important. There's also going to be a greater focus, hopefully, on queen breeding rather than just queen production. And again, I'm not trying to be negative to the large queen producers. I, some of them are my friends, and I, they provide a very useful and necessary service. But many large-scale producers are not really paying so much attention to the breeding aspect, but rather the propagation, the production, just trying to raise large numbers of, of queens for sale because, you know, the market needs this. There, there's a demand for that and a, and a need for it. But perhaps we might get smaller breeders producing smaller numbers of queens with selective breeding, maybe more breeding for characteristics beyond only productivity, you know, overwintering ability, mite resistance, and some of these other traits. 
And hopefully, perhaps there might be some increased awareness and recognition by academic and, and governmental programs for the needs of sideline, backyard, and hobbyist beekeepers. They might have a different need as compared to those of us that, you know, are maybe commercial beekeeping. Um, of course, funding is everything. So without funding, you know, th that's not going to happen. So that's a that's a comment to backyard and hobbyist beekeeper groups and clubs and associations. If you can find ways to support your local academic and governmental programs, um, be, be try to do the try to try to do that. And and that ends this presentation all about queens queen bee basics. The next series of presentations will get into the actual process and methods for breeding and raising queen bees. Thank you so much for. Uh, watching this set of videos.